Benji. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's yes, so miss. good to be sitting here talking to you. Cool. Um, so we're in Newport. Hometown. You were born and bred here. Born and bred. Tell me a bit about growing up here. I grew up in, um, well, I, I was born in a place called Somerton and we moved, for some reason, we moved to Ringland, uh, Ringland in the 70s. It was, um, it, it, it was a challenge, you know, being, a, being one of the only black families in the area. Growing up, you learned quickly that there was a divide and you learned to dodge the snakes and the ladders, you know. You know? And the divide came from, I think a lot, a lot of the stuff was to do with like people not knowing the, the culture of black people in, in the town. But I, I found that quickly you knew who to keep away from and who, who was nice, you know, who was naughty and nice, basically. I lived in Ringland, but I moved to Pearl because it was more black people. And I wanted to be blacker than I was, you know. I wanted to be black, black, you know, not just black. <laughs> True black. You know, yeah, real black person. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but growing up in Newport, I found it, it was a beautiful place because of the... There wasn't like black and white. It was like more like wrong and right kind of thing. And that's, and that's what I remember as a kid growing up and my, where my brothers would have white friends and they would have black friends. And, and, and it, it, there was a bit of a harmony. I, I thought there was a harmony in Newport growing up. My mother died when I was eight and my father died when I was 12. So I never got a lot of information from them growing up, you know. When my mother passed away and my father passed away, I was left to be raised by my brother and sister, you know, and they didn't really want me anyway, but. They ended, you know, I ended up being brought up by them and that was a lesson in itself because I went from being the baby of the family to being like, you know, the guy who no one wanted, <laughs> you know, oh but no, it wasn't like that though. I just, I just knew that I was a troublesome little kid. I was always in trouble doing something, saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, you know, but um, after my parents died, that's when I sort of remember more so than when they were here, you know. Did music play a role in yeah. forming you? In that I think having a voice as a little boy you know singing for cigarettes in the girls toilets you know that was definitely i mean the only thing i mean i wasn't academically good at anything but you know i was always the one getting thrown out of the classroom but when it came to entertaining the class before the band before any of that stuff i could i could hold a, i could hold the classes and, and entertain them and the kids used to love it when i used to be stupid you know and then that made me worse you know yeah so but the music thing came through my brothers i think my um it, we were filming this thing today, this used to be the Odeon and um, years ago this was the Odeon cinema and I remember breaking in here with my friends with a, with a, <laughs> with a, a coat hanger and rushing in here and sitting in, and finding spaces in this place sitting down and watching a film and one of the first films I seen, well not one, it was a, I was watching another movie but they showed a trailer for a movie called Dance Craze uh, which was about the British ska movement at the time so I'm sat in the crowd and I'm seeing these black guys on stage, not on this stage, but in the movie, these black guys and these white guys, bands like Madness, um, uh, The Specials, and I'm just blown away with what I'm seeing because these guys on the, on, on the screen, they look like they were from a council estate like me. They look like my brother's friends, you know? And, I, and for me, that was like, wow, if they can do this kind of stuff, I can do that kind of stuff, you know? And I always wanted to be in a band. And as a kid growing up, I like punk rock music. And my brothers were heavily into re reggae music, you know. And when I came home with um, Bad Manners, the first album I bought, I bought in town. And it was, um, I bought upstairs in Rockaway, I think it was called, Rockaway Records. And I bought, my auntie gave me £10, the first £10 I ever had. And I went into town and I bought uh, Lip Up Fatty. But Bad Manners, his first album was called Looney Tunes. And I went home. And I was playing it in the living room upstairs. My brother opened the door because he was saying, lip up fatty, yeah, lip up fatty, fatty reggae. And my brother walked in, he went, this ain't reggae. You know, and I was like, it's reggae to me. So, but, they, but the, the good thing about it, the punk rock music for me, the bands like The Clash, you know, they, they, they just really made me want to do music, which was multicultural, not just black music or, or whatever. They, I really wanted to make music which brought the world together. Brought, brought my friends together. And like, for me, when I started singing, I started singing reggae music, but I always loved punk rock, you know, Adam and the Ants, all, all that stuff, the ruts, all that stuff meant so much to me. So I'd have all these records, I'd be playing my brother's reggae records and loving them, but at the same time, I'd be putting on the Sex Pistols and stuff like that. You know, and like, a lot of, my, a lot of my, my age friends were like, how can you listen to that? I said, how could you not listen to it? It's, it's amazing, you know? And, and one thing about the struggle, it's funny because you got, you got all these Jamaican artists singing about equal rights and justice, and then you got all these punk rock artists singing the same thing. So they're both in the same situation, singing about the same thing, which is like equal rights, justice, you know what I mean? Let's stop beating people up, let's live together. 
And that's what reggae and punk done for me as a kid growing up. And as, as an adult, when I got the chance to make music, I always wanted to make music which, which involved like the latest reggae, the reggae thing and the heavy metal thing. And, and it's really been my salvation. It feels like, you know, when you describe the kind of fusion of the different types of music, it feels like it's about you in a way, because you are, you are Welshman, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got your you know, Kittish and heritage, Indies, yeah. yeah, you know, um, and, and it's all these things coming together in this little, this little child, yeah, this 11-year-old, yeah, yeah. this 12-year-old, and it's coming out in that, in that I, I, understanding. I, I really think that growing up in an in a area where you had Rastas and punk Rastas and, and all, these different kind of, all these different kind of people, it's a, it was a big influence on me. I remember being in my house and one of my brother's friends who was a Rasta, dreadlocks, ganja smoker, all that stuff. He was, in, my, he was in, the, in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen, I was playing the pistols. And he opened the door and he said, he said is that the Sex Pistols? And he asked me, could he borrow the album? And I was blown away and so blessed that this guy who was like black like me, he wanted the punk rock stuff, he wanted it. And he took the album and he had the album for about two weeks. So when he brought it back, I was, I was made up that he, he actually wanted it, you know? So I always, I look at my music like a bridge building music. Skin Dread and Dub War, they've been like bridge building music. Like a lot of people come up to me and they go, hey man, I just bought the Sean Paul album because I listened to, for, to Skin Dread for the first time and I enjoyed the ragga stuff where you were doing. And it works both ways. I like got black guys coming up to me and saying, I listen to, I've been listening to this heavy metal band. I've been listening to this rock band because of the bridge that you put between the two musics, you know? And I think, I feel that's something that I'm, I, I've been blessed with to do that, to be able to bring the nations together. Mm -hmm. So tell me a bit about Skin Dread then. When well, did it start? Well, well, I was in a band from Newport, all the guys from Newport. Well, I started, I used to sing, I was just trying to sing. I used to sing on reggae sound systems, up and down Bristol, Cardiff. I sang on sound systems for years, trying to be blacker than I am, you know? Tell me, what do you mean when you say that? Do you're black already. You've already got that. But when I say trying to be blacker, it's like, trying to talk with a, with a Jamaican accent and <laughs> trying to eat rice and peas all the time. Just trying to be black, you know, trying to be that. I was better off being myself, you know, okay. that's what I thought. I was better off being me. Yeah. And um, the first band I was in was Dub War. And that was a, another clash of like sort of rock, um, punk rock and reggae. Um, we did very well all over the world. We'd be supporting bands up and down the country. And we'd go on stage and people would be looking at us. You know when you show a puppy a ball for the first time? And I'd get on stage and people would be like, eh? Eh? trying to suss us out. But you know what? One thing that stood us apart is we were good and we delivered a live show. And I still got the same fans from, well, 25 years who were into Dub War. They're still into Skin Dread and they still follow us. And the one thing about it is like, I'm getting like three generations. I'm getting the grandfather, the son and his kids coming to the show. But you gotta believe this now. I've been in Skin Dread for 20 years and I've had the same lineup for 20 years. Yeah? What? And I mean, that's, that's pretty much unheard of. So we must be doing something right, you know? What keeps it fresh? I think because we mix the music. I think that because it's not, it's like, I love ACDC and I don't want to hear a dubstep remix of ACDC. <laughs> Simple as that. But we, are, we can afford to, to move with the times. Plus the, the message of unity has drawn from way back when, from Dub War all the way through Skin Dread, the message of unity and people coming together. You know, I've, what I find is I get a lot of emails and, and messages from people who, who've been downtrodden and they feel encouraged by the, the lyrics that I write and the message of, of, of unity and the message of in, uh, overcoming troubles. You know, there's a lot of people out there who don't get that message, but I, 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 I prefer someone to listen to Skin Dread or Dub War and say, you know what, I was encouraged to, to continue the battle that I was going through. And I, and I read that all the time, that people say that it's because of your music I, I got through this and I got through that, and that's a blessing. So your music, so your... your your kind of template is not just about the bridge building and the, the mixing of genres in that way, mm -hmm. but it's also about the message that you're preaching. Oh yeah, the message right? is everything. I, do you know what, I always say this, right? If someone, if, if someone left um, the sleeve from my album on the, on the train without hearing the music and they picked it up and read it, I'd want them to be encouraged just by the lyrics, not the music, not knowing who wrote it, just the words, you know, to uplift people. You know, I, I, I always say to people, if I can't encourage, motivate and uplift people, what am I making music for? It's pointless. Tell me a bit more about your performances. Where have you performed? Where have I performed? We, um, well, we, we, we performed in here. This, yeah, we played in this same, same place. I can't remember when it was, but I know it was, it was um, 
Bonfire Night we played in here, one Bonfire Night. And I was worried because Bonfire Night in Newport, no one's around. Everyone goes doing fireworks and stuff. No one's going to hang around. But what I found, I was like, oh God, it's my hometown. Please, Lord, let people be in the gig. And um, there, was a, there was a line around the street. I was so blessed. Yeah, the line went down the street, all up, on, all up on there. There was people all up there, all down there. I was looking, I was seeing my school teacher. I was seeing my milkman. I, I could see the girl from the post office. It was really good. Yeah, so the, playing, playing in the neon for, for me was a blessing. I played the Newport Center. You know, all these different places. Are, you know, we played Los Angeles, Australia. I've traveled so much. I mean, for what, for the education that I had, the little education, but I believe that it wasn't to do with school. It's about my connection with human beings. I played some festivals. We, the most people Skin Dread played in front of, we played at a festival called um, Woodstock. It's a charity show, and it's on the border between Poland and Germany. Uh, we went on that stage and played in front of 750,000 people. And I ain't lying. I'm telling the truth. You can, you can check it out yourself. I couldn't believe it. And we, like, we've played big shows. You know, we played festivals in front of 50,000 people, 80,000. But playing in front of that many people where you can't even see the back of the audience. Tell me what one of your shows would be like. What do we expect? Well, when we go in for there? me personally, I always look at it like I want to take people on a journey. You know, we... we you we know, we do like, we got like parts of the songs was like dance hall. And it's funny because when you come to a skin dread, see, skin dread show, you see like a 60 year old guy with a ball head and tattoos, you know, just giving her all out in the corner. Then you'd be like six young girls winding up and doing dirty wine, dirty wine. And it's the same song. So you got this guy giving us all this heavy metal stuff, you know, with his head shaking and you kid spinning his dreadlocks. And then you got these girls and it's the same song yeah. doing the bogle, bogle, bogle. <laughs> so you take from it what you yeah, yeah, and we just take the energy. Skin Dread shows are high energy shows. I challenge the audience. You know, and then we have um, times where there's a song that we sing called Saying It Now. And um, a few years back, a friend of mine passed away and I was on tour. I, I tell that story on stage and people, you know, I get so many people coming up to me and saying, you know, I needed that song. I needed that song. That's got me through. And even fans who, who, uh, who passed away, like I, I heard the other day, a lady who came to see 44 Skin Dread shows. She, she died of cancer recently and she was buried in our NHS t-shirt that Skin Dread did. We did an NHS to support the NHS through this virus. We did a t-shirt and it was for charity and we gave the charity the money to the NHS. And um, yeah, she was buried in the shirt. So we got some loyal fans who, who love the music. And as I said before, this music is not just about me getting money and I don't get much honey, but it is about, it is about giving, you know, make, being there for people. When did you recognize fame? When did fame come? When I was in the shop and the girl asked me for my autograph. <laughs> No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I am, um, like I said, I always wanted to be that kid in class that, you know, yeah. and I just felt like it's always been like that. I've always built a rapport with people and people would say, oh, there's that, there's that guy, there's that guy. But fame, I don't know. I'm still waiting to be famous. You know what I mean? I'm like, I feel like I want to have my fame. But um, I think keeping it real is better than fame. You know, keeping it real. I mean, and that's why I live in Newport. I live in Pearl in Newport. I mean, a lot of my friends say to me, hey, dude, why don't you live in there? Why don't you live here? I love Newport. I love it because I feel comfortable here. If I didn't, I'd be gone. I've known my neighbor for over 50 years. I'm quite happy where I am. I live in a decent neighborhood. It's not the best neighborhood. And like I said, I could live where there's not much trouble, but I choose to live in trouble because you know what? It's important to be a beacon of light, a beacon of light where you are. Don't go and hide the, your light under the bed somewhere else. Show people that they can be strong, in their own community. I, I believe that people will say, you know what, if he can do it and he's, and he's grounded, he's real, he stays where he is, why can't I? You know, and I, think, and I, I don't want to like hide my light under a bed. Mm -hmm. I, want it, I want it for the world to see. And when I say the world to see, I mean my world, which is Newport, my world, which is pill. So tell me about how coronavirus Oh has my God, it's killed me. The, the coronavirus has actually beat the hell. I, it's a sad state of affairs, you know. Um, I'm a positive person, you know. I mean, we had a, I think we had Australia booked, Japan booked, you know, and all this stuff. Bye, it was it was gone, and we we don't even know when we're going to be able to do that again. And what kills me, like, 
as a as a as a singer, I get I get royalties. As the band, we get royalties, and they're not great royalties, but the boys in in my crew, they're feeling it more than anything because that, all they've done for the last 40, 30, 25 years is rock and roll, doing you know setting up the stage, setting up that. When there's no stages to set up, they don't eat. And what about um, the rehashing of Black Lives Matter? Has that affected you in any way? Well, I mean, the, the, you got to remember that for me personally. Um, George Floyd was the catalyst that made America explode. But you can go way back, way back. This stuff has been happening so long. And that's why I'm glad that my side is on the side of love. The side I choose, never mind about any, any, any color of the skin, I choose about the good things. And obviously it breaks my heart when I see that because I, I've been writing about this stuff for years. And when I see, what, what, the injustice of black people not, not getting a job because of this and, and getting beaten and stuff like that. And, and I can't believe to the, even to this day this still goes on. You know, um, it, it's heart wrenching, you know, to see that, you know. And I just wish there was some sort of way that people could come together and put their differences aside and move on, you know. Do you think it's, um, you know, that you recognize that? whatever is happening in America, are there any is there any semblance of that in, in Wales or in England? Listen, the fact that the people, I won't even say black people, the fact that some people are, are, are pushed down because of what they have on or, or, or the way they look is a goddamn shame. We should be, like, 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 like King said, you know, we should be judging people on the conduct of their character, you know, not, not, not the color of their skin or their sexuality. Uh, and I think that's where we need to, we really need to think about that you know, going forward. Hate, 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 hate. That's always going to be there. But for me, it's about love. And I've, I've got the opportunity with Skin Dread to speak about love and speak about unity. So what's next for Skin Dread? We're, we're writing this record, um, which is sounding great. And um, we, we've booked a tour for October 2021. It's a long time away, but um, I'm excited for that. You know, this, in this time, Especially when you don't know it. It's very, the world is such a place where nobody knows what's happening. It's great to have something to look forward to. And I know it's a long time away. And I know that a lot of the people who dig Skin Dread, they're excited about that, you know. And um, we're just going to have to ride this, ride this madness through until such time as we can rock again. Mm -hmm.